In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we give him praise and thanks for his mercy and his goodness in sending to the members of the human family prophets and messengers who bring them divine revelation that those who have lost his favor may find the right path and walk therein and regain the favor of our Creator. Such a man was Moses who brought to us the Torah. Such a man was Jesus who brought to us the Gospel. Such a man was Muhammad who brought to us the Quran. Peace be upon these worthy servants of Allah. I am a student of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. <laughs> and Allah has once again shown his great mercy to a people who once were a great people but have been destroyed by an enemy who reduced us from what we once were to a destroyed nation. They made us to see them as their as our master and they put fear in us when we were babies that we would obey them as we should obey God and by obeying a wicked slave master he formed us and shaped us into his own image as a result of that, we are the scattered, divided, robbed, and spoiled people that we are today. It is not in keeping with the pattern of God that he should allow a whole people to be oppressed under a tyrant for over 400 years and he do nothing. That's just not God's way. So as he did for those in the past, he did even more for us because the scripture says he would not send someone. He would come himself. And in his coming, he would seek among us one with the right heart that would love us enough that he would be willing to endure whatever the modern Pharaoh would do 
to deliver us and make us a great people once again. We thank him for his coming. We thank him for his wise choice of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. We thank him for the wisdom that he gave to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that would take us from where we are and make us a supreme people and give us the lost sheep, the lost brother, the scepter of rulership. But we would have to be cleansed from the way of our former slave masters and their children. We would have to be purified and we would have to be made into a new vessel so that he could pour a new wine into a new vessel and make us a people that our former slave masters and their children would tip their hat to and bow to to prove that God has come and he has shown his favor to the black man and woman of America and through us his favor to our people wherever they are on the planet and through us to all humanity. I greet you my dear brothers and sisters with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. To brother Sharif and members of the student laboring class to the believers of mosque number 15 and to those who have come from whatever distance to be a part of the 12th anniversary of the now historic Million Man March. I'm very, 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 very honored to be in Atlanta. Yes. <laughs> I'm very honored to be in the state that produced the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I'm happy to see your smiling and beautiful faces. And to see so many of my wonderful family from New York, Mass number seven. and those who laid the foundation that the new Muslims stand on today. We give honor and thanksgiving for those who followed the Honorable Elijah Muhammad during his presence and years among us. They made the sacrifice. They were tried and they persevered and they gave a beautiful example that we must try to live up to today. It would be a shame to dishonor the memory of those who helped to make us who and what we are. It would be tragic to dishonor the memory of those wonderful ministers and captains and secretaries and sister captains and beautiful FOI and MGT, many of whom have passed away, but they are not forgotten. They are not forgotten.
they gave us a wonderful legacy to live up to. And we want to be found living up to that great legacy of the early followers and companions of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I thought I would stop by the mosque, you know. I, <clears throat> I didn't, you know, have anything particular to say, but I always know that if I'm blessed to stand before his people, and he would give me something yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. to give his people. Yes, sir. And so I'll start with this. Blessed are they who find their purpose in life and are found living that purpose. So many of us are like seeds that have never been dropped in the right soil. So the birds come and pluck up the seed and we live and we die without ever knowing what our real purpose for being was. So many ask me, well, what can I do to help? As though I know you <laughs> better than you know yourself. But I'm going to lay down a principle tonight that is a prerequisite for service. Because so many of us want to put the cart before the horse. We want honor, we want prestige, we want position, we want title, we want all these things, but we don't want work. We don't want sacrifice. We don't want to be tried. And we, like children, are looking for instant gratification. And we get angry with Allah, God, when he demands of us patience. A human being is not born patient. Human beings are born from the very cradle to want instant gratification of desire. So as we quote unquote mature, we want our wives to be great for us instantly. She wants her husband to be great for her instantly. She fell in love, you know, because he looked good. Uh, and he fell in love because she looked good. But now something else is required. And all of a sudden we're filled with disappointment because we did not know that to form anything of value it takes time. So Allah, the wise God, created the human, but he demands of us to have the quality of patience. In the 18th surah of the Quran, Moses is traveling in search of knowledge with a wise man. 
And he asked the wise man, you know, can, can I walk with you? And the wise man said, well, no, you, you better go on, do what you've been doing. He said, but I, I want to walk with you. He said, but, but you can't have patience with me. He said, because you don't have a comprehensive knowledge. And when you don't have a comprehensive knowledge where you see the end product before it comes into existence, then you can be patient to see it. Like a woman who finds out she's expecting. Well, she knows I'm, I'm pregnant. She knows it's going to take at least nine months. Well, she don't want to see it as a clot. I mean, some do. They want to get rid of it, you know. Don't, don't, don't do that. But there are some who know, well, you, you know, I'll wait on time. Because it takes time for what is in the womb to develop to the point where it can come forth and make you pleased with what you produced. Of course, when the burden gets heavy, you want it out of you. And still it can't happen until... It's time. Well, what about the time that it takes to make a devil? And what about the time that it would take to make a God? See? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that it took 600 years to graft white out of black. He didn't live to see it, but he saw it. He worked 150 years and died, but he had people that carried out his principles and his labor. So after 600 years, what he envisioned in the year one came to fruition. And the Caucasian was born. Now the God comes to choose us. He didn't choose you because you were good. Because our slave master didn't make us good. He didn't choose us because we were righteous. Because the slave master didn't make us righteous. Well, then why would God choose a so-called Negro to be his people? Has he lost it? And anybody that would choose a Negro... You would have to say, is he all there? Or what does he know that we don't know? What did he see that we don't see? He had a comprehensive knowledge of things. And he saw in us the material that he could use to make a new people and a new world and establish the kingdom of God on earth. But Moses, unfortunately, in this picture, just couldn't be patient because God is so wise. He does things that we can't understand. Unless he brings us into understanding, we can't understand what he's doing. So people ask today with all this bloodshed all over the earth, where's God? When 9-11 took place and the towers went down and 3,000 Americans and others died, the question was asked, where was God? 
because we think that God is not present in disaster. <laughs> we think that God is not present in war. We think that God is not present in misfortune. We fix God up to be what we want him to be. He's a good God. Of course he is. But that don't mean he won't allow evil. He's a good God. But evil has a purpose. Otherwise, he would not have allowed Satan to rule. So even in the rule of Satan, God is present. Just not actively present in that Satan is given power over his creatures to produce an effect. We often wonder, well, God, if you're such a good God, why did you let our former slave masters treat us like this? That's a very good question. You such a good God. How you going to let this man hang us? How you going to let this man castrate us? How you going to let this man enslave us? And you so good. How, why should I believe in you? So the God just says, well, young man or young woman, have you studied my pattern? Have you studied the pattern of life itself? Have you studied the struggle of life to come forth out of darkness? Have you studied the pain that coming out of darkness produces? Have you studied why I have ordained struggle for every life? And if you don't want to struggle and face difficulties, then maybe you should never have been born because that's my pattern. How dare you fall out because some misfortune has come in your life? Well, you know, we, we was in a fire and everything got burned up and, yes, what else? And some of my family died in the fire. Yes, I gave life. I'm the ultimate cause of death. You got a problem with my will? Because you're going to die too. And you don't know how, you don't know in what circumstance, you don't know in what place, but you do know. You do know. You getting up out of here. That's the pattern of life. If you don't want to die, then you should never have been born. But now that you're born, then you need to understand what is the purpose for your life before you get out of here. Some of you, some of you are so happy to praise and honor Jesus without ever considering the price that God permitted him to pay for the redemption of others. You don't mind him paying a price. Glad it wasn't me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. But don't ask me to pay no price 
And I want to be your son. I want to be your daughter. But Lord, what you did to your son. Hell, I, I don't know whether I want to be your son. <laughs> Donald B. Elijah Muhammad used to say, they all want my place, but they don't want to pay my price. We all want greatness. We dream about being great. But the road to greatness is not an easy road. When God chooses a people to raise them from ignominy to eminence, the road is hard. The process of making you into something that you never dreamed you could be is difficult. But so many of you want something in life, but when the test of sacrifice or suffering practice, well, I think I'll change my mind. I remember when I was a young boy, I used to play the violin at school assemblies. And I, I, I did play well, and so some of my classmates would say, Gee, Lewis, uh, how long have you been playing that thing, you know? I said, oh, about seven years now. Seven years. <laughs> they thought they could just pick it up and play. So many of you started like this. Mama gave you a piano. You hit a few notes and all of a sudden you say, oh, damn, this is. Ma, give me a guitar. Ma, give me a saxophone. Ma, give me a clarinet. I don't care what mama give you. If you're going to be great, you have to make a sacrifice. And because you want instant greatness, you're never prepared to suffer to become great. Blessed are they who find their purpose in life, but even more blessed are they who become what their purpose is. See, to say I know why I'm here, but then don't do nothing about it. You're an enemy to yourself. The little sick life we're living Sick life. Get up in the morning. Eat. Turn on the TV. Eat. Go to work if you got a job. Eat. Come back home. Eat. Look at the TV. Eat. Say, wait, that's a hell of a life. And year after year after year, you go downtown Atlanta, you see a pair of shoes you want. So you put your little money aside and you get your shoes and you, oh, don't I look good? God, look at them shoes. Stilettos, too. Mm. You get the things in life that you seek. A new car, a fur coat, a new apartment, a new house, and you're only happy for a moment. For a moment. Because nothing that you have is there to fulfill your purpose. Nothing that you acquire can give you the joy that only working to be what God created you to be will give you. <laughs> the 
Well, how do I discover myself? I'm going to give you a journey. I've always loved black people. And I heard that there was a man in America who loved black people and did something about it. He was raising black people up from the condition that white America had imposed on us. I said, let me go hear this man. When I heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I wasn't quite convinced, you know. I was somewhat convinced. My wife jumped up and joined. <laughs> she joined ahead of me. And <laughs> I was a little slow. I was in show business, and I heard she was going to the temple. I said, don't go. Don't go till I check this out. She didn't pay me no attention. She went on to the temple and heard the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So when she saw him, she was ready right then. I had never been before. I wasn't, I was fairly convinced. But I went back to New York and I went over to temple number seven and brother Malcolm came out and taught. Well, it was James seven next, the first night I was there. And uh, he was convincing, he was convincing. But I was leaning then, you know what I mean? I didn't fall over quite. But that Sunday when I came out and Brother Malcolm took the rostrum, I never heard a man speak like Malcolm spoke that day. And I thought, maybe this is God, you know? But this man was talking stuff. And I couldn't hold back. I came on in and got registered up to be a Muslim. I didn't know that Muslim was my nature. I didn't know that Islam was the true religion of God and all his prophets. I didn't know that, but I knew what Malcolm was saying about the black man and God's coming for us, that, that just resonated with me. I didn't want to leave the church. I like my Sunday school class. But Malcolm had me, I fell over. And I became a Muslim and the brothers that saw me come in are sitting here tonight Brother Charles Bobbitt, Brother Thomas J, Brother James 7X, these are my parents. And if Sister Sylvia Shaw is in the building, where's my sister? In the back? Sylvia. Oh boy, let's hear it. See now, I'm sorry, we gotta make room. I, oh man, I wanna look at my sister. But listen, her husband, 
is the man that made me a Muslim. Her husband was the man that made soldiers. Her husband was the man that shaped me after Malcolm got me. And I don't care how great the teaching is, if you don't have a soldier that can help to shape you into what you just heard, you got one half of the pie, but the other you never got. And most of you don't know that. Man, I would pick that sister up and carry her. Take your time, Sister Shah. Because that sister and her family made a great sacrifice. And today, today, it's time for us to pay honor and respect to those who made a way for all of us. Where's Yvonne? Oh, precious. I got to get you a chair somewhere down here with me. Now, I know, I mean, we took a little breather for a minute. But I wanted to say this because her husband, the last time I saw him, I was in Phoenix, Arizona, and he was working with Don King in Las Vegas, Nevada. And brother Captain Yusuf came to see me in Phoenix. We spent several hours together and when he was leaving I kissed his beautiful bald head <laughs> because I know that without him I could never have been the man that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad ultimately was making me to be and it's men like this and women like Amina Rasul and, and others they have paid a price and we cannot be unfaithful to the memory of those whose faith shaped us As I was saying, I came in to mosque number seven under Brother Malcolm. I regret his breakup with his teacher. I was terribly hurt by that breakup. But I pray that Allah will reward Brother Malcolm for the best of what he did because the best of what he did helped to make me. Yes. I was only in the mosque 30 days and a letter came down from Elijah Muhammad and either you do your music or you get out of the mosque. You, gotta, you can't have both. Many of the musicians in the mosque left. But Brother Farrakhan, and I never will forget this, a brother came to the restaurant. It was Temple Number no. 7 Luncheonette on 120th Street and Lenox Avenue. We had rabbits in there. Well, they looked like rabbits. They were that big, but they were rats. <laughs> they were the Harlem Rat Squad. 
And I was working in a nightclub downtown, so I came up to have soup because I missed the mass meeting. And a brother came in telling me, man, a letter was read today. You got 30 days to get out of music or get out of the Mars. I got up from the table. I may have walked about 30 or 40 paces. And I said a prayer. I said, Allah, I can live without music. But I can't live without the truth. So right there, I made up my mind to give up music. As I turned to walk back to the luncheonette, Yusuf Shah was coming toward me. And he was angry with this brother who just dropped it on me because Yusuf was going to say it in a way that would, you know, help me to make the right decision. But I told him I had already made the decision. I was giving up my music. Now, the road to greatness starts with sacrificing something that you love for God. I'm going to say it again now. If there's nothing that you can sacrifice, to show God that your love for him is greater than the thing that you love that he's asking you to sacrifice, then you are not worthy for God to use you. Listen good now. Jesus came to Peter and Peter was fishing. That's how Peter made his living. Jesus didn't keep him there. He said, come follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. So he put down his net and he followed the master. Then Jesus later on says, if any man would be my disciple, he must first deny himself Pick up his cross and follow me. This is the Jesus talking. What I'm about to ask you to do tonight, I don't care nothing about Assalamu Salaikum. And we love you, Farrakhan. I appreciate that. But tonight, I'm going to ask you, what are you willing to give up that you love that is not good for you to find the greatness of God and your purpose in life? When I came to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I had a reefer in my hat band because they tell me they search when you come in the mosque. So I took my reefer in the hat band and they searched, but they didn't find my reefer. So after Elijah Muhammad had finished teaching, I could get my smoke on. But after that man got through teaching, I went in the hat band and got my reefer and threw it away got my cigarettes and threw them away, got my music and threw it away because I was willing to make a sacrifice to find out what is my real purpose in life. The real road to discovery of who you are starts with recognition of God and surrender. That's where it starts. By nature, you are Muslim. So the lesson says, accept your own and be 
yourself. Well, what is my own self? My own self is a righteous Muslim. Well, are there any Muslims other than righteous? I beg your pardon. I never heard of one. Of course we have. Look in the mirror, there's one. Look at your neighbor, there's two. Look around the room, there's three, four hundred, five hundred. People that are other than themselves. But God has begged their pardon. He did not come to charge us with our sins. He came to forgive us for our sins and start us on the road to self-discovery. And the road to self-discovery starts, what are you willing to give up to discover yourself? When I gave up my reefer, The cigarette was even harder to give up than the reefer. But I gave that up. I was red on pork. New Year's hoghead cheese. Mama knew how to lay into a ham. But when I became a Muslim, this is forbidden, divinely forbidden meat. And after the Honorable Elijah Muhammad showed us in the scripture where that wasn't good for me, I dropped off the pork. Man, self-discovery is something. Then Elijah Muhammad said, I want to teach you how to eat to live. And he said, not three meals. One meal a day. And I did that. It was rough at first. But I did it. All along, I was being trained. See, the road to self-discovery starts with knowing that you are created in the nature of God. And righteousness is your nature. And if you start back to the road of doing right, then everything else starts materializing. Listen, listen. We were poor and raggedy. I'll say it again. We were poor and raggedy. But we were happy, poor and raggedy because we had a truth that made us never to think poverty. We were poor, but we didn't think poor. And gradually, God increased the means of subsistence for us. The enemy didn't like the mosque. He sometimes would attack the mosque. And we beat him down with no weapons because we were so strong in our faith in Allah who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad that no matter what we suffered we held tight together on the road to self-discovery 
I didn't know where I would end up. I had no idea that one day, by Allah's grace, I would sit in the seat of the man that all of us came to love. And I would know that I was unworthy to unlace his shoes. But by his grace, I was chosen to help rebuild his work. The road to self-discovery is long. I didn't even know that I could speak. I used to stammer. Yeah. And when I became a Muslim, Brother Malcolm, on a Wednesday night, Asked some of us to come up and say what Islam had done for us. And when I spoke that night, the temple went up and they were cheering. Uh, I, I didn't understand why they were cheering. But that night I discovered speech. And now, speech. Has your brother known all over the world? Speech. Has your brother loved? All over the world. But just not speech. It's the anointing of the Spirit of God. Now I'm coming to something and I, I, I want to help you to see this because... See, you all are great. There's not one in here that is not great. But you have the duty to discover your greatness. And it starts by remembering first who God created you to be. He created you first to be righteous. Now, you, you didn't hear me. I think I need to say that one more time. <laughs> See, and you want God to fulfill his part of the covenant. Money, good homes, and friendship in all walk of life. But you don't want to fulfill your part, or we don't want to fulfill our part, which is to clean up. He said, if you don't clean up, you're out of luck with us. Now, I'm very happy to be at Mars number 15 and I'm looking, I'm looking at the nation and I see something that disturbs me. You know, when Moses went to the mountain, he left Aaron in charge. But then the people went a little silly and started worshiping. A golden calf. And I start looking at us. I start looking at us. You know, the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all its what? Righteousness. And all things will be added unto you. God don't lie. We turned it around. Seek ye first the things. And to heck with righteousness. So you got things, but you got debt. You got things. But you got an oppressor now who's oppressing you for the bills. You got things, but you've lost your religion. So there's nothing in the things that can satisfy you. 
Now you've become worshipers of a golden calf. Watch this. In the Quran it says that the calf made a lowing sound. Didn't have a good sound. It made a lowing sound. Air coming through. And here they had the voice of God that had spoken to them through Moses. And now they got this calf that made a funny sound. See, and that's where many of the mosques are. You're not making the right sound from here. Because the right sound lifts the spirit. The right sound inspires the believer to be better. The right sound makes the soul yearn to be close to God. The right sound doesn't leave you in fear, under oppression. The right sound frees you. See? But the lowing sound. It's the sound that is killing the spirit of the people because it's all about money. And it's not all about the kingdom of God. Now wait, 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 wait. Ain't no question that you need money. I need money. We need money. We don't have money in a world like this. We're in trouble. So it's not bad to have money. It's not bad to seek money. That's proper. But if money becomes greater than the need for service to God and your people, then the sound that we make starts dropping. And it becomes a lowing sound. And then you begin to find desolation. People walking away. People can't handle it. Atlanta and the nation have great potential. Potentially, this is a great mosque. But if you're saddled with debt, what follows that is the oppression of men. That is why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said we should pray this prayer seven times a day. Oh Allah, I seek your refuge from anxiety and grief. And I seek your refuge from the lack of strength and laziness. And I seek your refuge from cowardice and niggardliness. And I seek your refuge from being overpowered by debt and the oppression of men. See? So then you say, suffice thou me with what is with what is meaning you can't steal. You are not going to be seen in Tupelo, Mississippi at the gambling resort. Suffice thou me with what is lawful and keep me away from what is prohibited and with your grace make me free from want of what is beside you now I can close I 
I found my purpose in life. It is to serve Allah. It is to follow his divine apostle, messiah, messenger, the honorable Elijah Muhammad, and to use the wisdom that he taught to raise our people up in America, in the Caribbean, in Central and South America, in Africa, and then take his teachings to the ends of the earth. I found my reason for being. And I'm willing to sacrifice my life to fulfill my purpose. See? Now I think I'm not by myself. I think that there are others who found their purpose in life and are willing to give up the world to find peace with God and discover their own greatness and stop bowing down to the enemy of God thinking that he got something for you that is better than what God promises. Now, I'm going to ask you tonight. I'm looking at a powerful mosque. There's enough knowledge in this house right now of those who studied. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, those who worked in some capacity in the nation but right now are not doing anything. Going to work, coming home, going to work, coming home, eat, going to work, coming home, eat, 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 eat. And all this ignorance is are, are out here among our people and we have the knowledge that can remove the veil of ignorance from our people and we're doing nothing. What is the duty of the civilized man? And if the civilized man fails to perform his or her duty, what must be done? I don't want no excuses. I'm tired. I work two jobs. I'm tired. Yeah. Last year this time, your brother was dying. Last year this time, I had lost 30 pounds in October. By November, I was in the hospital with infections and the doctors told me if I didn't have this operation it was only a matter of time before the infections that I kept having and the pain that I was in, the excruciating pain that I would die. Huh. Many of my Christian friends, um, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, uh, Tavis Smiley and Cornell West and some of the great preachers in Chicago that came by my bed and, and they prayed with me and prayed for me. And some of them looked at me and said, we don't think um, Farrakhan is going to make it. And when I had a bleed out and they had to rush me again to the hospital. Even Mother Khadija looked at me and said, well, maybe he's gone. They put me on that table 
And as they were wheeling me in for the operation, a beautiful black woman came to my bedside and, and said, my name is Grace. And when I knew that Grace was with me, I went in that operation and 14 hours on the table opened up. And the doctors would come out to my family and said his heart is beating like a racehorse. And in that operation, I just lost about that much blood. See? And when the operation was over, and they brought me to the next morning, Brother Sharif was there. <clears throat> Some of my other doctors were there. And I raised my hand to try to give them a But it was so much pain when I did that, you know. My next birthday, I'll be 75. Yeah. 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 Uh, don't tell that story now, come on. <laughs> but I appreciate it, daughter. <laughs> She said he looked 14. I said, yeah, right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but listen, family, listen. At my age, I don't take a pill. I have no medication. I don't even take an aspirin for a headache. This is the God's truth. What, what I'm trying to say to you, and most all of you in here prayed for me, that the prayers of the righteous availeth much. God wasn't through with me. But as I looked at the condition of the believing people, I said, I can't go anywhere until we straighten out the house. I, I know it's difficult, wait, to take away a title. Because it makes people feel naked. That's too bad. No, 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 it really is too bad. Because if wearing a title gives you clothing for a wounded, sick ego, then the title added something to you, not from the inside, but from the outside. So I removed that. Not permanently. But I removed it so we could get in touch with the nakedness of our being. See? We like bling bling. And it does something for us. We like fine cars and nice things. And it does something for us. What, what does it do for you? It makes us feel better than our neighbor that don't have what we are showing off. See, that's sickness. That's sick. See, if I can put a chain on my face, on my neck, bling blinging, 
and it makes me feel better, that's because I'm empty on the inside. If I got to have a Cadillac, when a Volkswagen would do, Now, I have a Rolls Royce. Wait, wait, no, 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 listen, listen. I got a Rolls. I got the best that the enemy makes. I wear beautiful clothes. Expensive shoes. I have so many watches that people have given me as I travel all over the world. Diamond this, ruby that. I don't wear it no more. I refuse. Because I don't need nothing on the outside to make me feel better on the inside. I am what I am and nothing can add to what I am that's material. So, by taking away titles, I want you now to look in the mirror at your nakedness. Minister done took my title, see? We like to be dictators. We like authority. But you know the Quran, when you read it, Allah gave Moses and Aaron a clear authority. So I'm not a man without authority. And all you that are under me are functioning on my authority. Wait a minute. And I have never treated you like a tyrant. Well, why would you treat others like that when you are not treated like that? What I was doing was removing from us that which would earn us the chastisement of God. Because see, every one of these people, I don't care what you think about them, but you got to check your thinking. Everybody's not going to come up the way you think. Everybody is not going to look the way it pleases you or me. But when Master Farad came 9,000 miles, he didn't come for one of us. He came for all of us. And all of us mean something to him. And all of us should mean something to those who want to help him. So. By, by, by taking away these superficial things, it gives us a chance to look on the inside at our emptiness. See? Adam, Adam, why, why are you running with that fig leaf? When I put you in the garden, you had clothes on. How did you become naked? Well, I ate of the wrong tree. See? When you start acting like your former slave masters and their children, you're eating 
from the wrong tree. God is about to destroy him and his world. So if you want to be like them, you're in serious trouble. So to take titles away, see, and you look in the mirror and say, wow, I'm feeling hurt. He took away my title and he took away my authority. I didn't take that away. I wanted you to become a servant. See, if you think in authority and you think in title, you're not thinking service. See? And Jesus said, he who would be greatest among you, let him be your servant. See, the white man never trained you how to serve each other. You know how to serve white people. But when it comes to serving black people, now you got all these funny pics in your head. This one too black, this one too light. This one thinks she cute because she got a fine shape. Cover that damn thing, I mean, cover your body, girl. All these little petty jealousies and whatnot, you see? Well, you can't serve. You're an enemy to service. Master Farad didn't come talking about too light, too dark, hair too curly, hair too kinky. He loved us all. How can you help him and help his Messiah? If you got these stupid pics. Some of our people have had it. They don't trust nothing or nobody. And they come in the mosque and they sit. And every time you open your mouth, they got a yardstick in their head. Of the thieves and the robbers that have robbed them in the name of unity, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Moses, in the name of Muhammad, and they're saying, I ain't going for that no more. So they sit, and you got to win them. You got to win them. Now, see, listen good now. See, this is another man's catch. Whenever you, you all come here, or the, come as a minister, you had a house. It wasn't empty. Somebody else's fish was in the, in the boat. You ain't supposed to empty the boat out. But you're supposed to get your own catch. But don't destroy the catch that was in the boat before you got here. Now look, 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 look. What, what, what am I doing? What, 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 what am I doing? Do I have some ax to grind? I don't. I love my brother laborers and sister laborers. And I want to help them to be better servants. The nation is like a runaway train. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad can't recognize this as his own. If we don't come back now to the restrictive law and strive to live it, what are you willing to give up to discover your purpose? I gave up the world and I found myself. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad kept trying to tell me things about myself, but I had such an inferiority 
complex. And people who are inferior, they mask it with sometimes feelings of superiority, but that's only the act to cover the self that is wounded. Am I making sense? I came out of show business. When you're in show business, you work for applause. And when you tear the house up and the house is screaming, you go back in your dressing room and you say, oh boy. So he said, you can't do that no more. So I come in the mosque. So you preach and preach my man to teach, man, teach. And you get just as drunk and stupid because it's fulfilling an ego need. Because the people ain't applauding you. Say, Damn, what's wrong? I ain't saying nothing. They don't like me no more. But we're not here to get applause. We're here to raise the level of consciousness of a people and make them better in the sight of God and more productive human beings. That's our aim. That's our mission. So all this sickness of the heart, we have to now peel back. You ever see that picture of Jesus with his heart sitting out here? That meant he had no secrets. He had no guile or deceit. See, a lot of us in leadership playing games. Hiding the rottenness of our soul. Behind noble words. But ignoble deeds. So when the heart is exposed and the disease is seen, then we can apply the medicine to begin the healing process. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, what man having a river outside of his house that he bathes in five times a day would come up unclean. See, this needs to be cleansed. We need to clean up. That's what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad meant when he said clean up internally and externally. But the internal cleansing is the cleansing of the heart. Envy, jealousy, enmity, strife, greed, false pride, lust for things, okay? covetousness. See that Negro riding that car? I should have that. I should have that. Well, yes, you should. But covetousness is not going to give it to you. Allah is not a liar. If you submit, he said, sit yourself in heaven at once. With luxury, money, good homes, and friendship in all walk of life. But he says, submit. You don't have to envy nobody for what they got. Submit. Now let me close. Be patient with yourself. Because you'll be up one day and down the next. You'll be pleased one day and displease the next. Yes, You'll be peaceful one day yes, and very angry the next. Yes, but be patient with yourself yes, because God is not through with you yet. Yes, 
See? Don't look in the mirror and talk down to you. Oh, man, you said no good. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but that's not you. That's the enemy in you. So when you look at yourself and you're not pleased with yourself, naked, I'm not talking about with your clothes off. I'm talking about naked when you see yourself exposed to your own conscience. And it's whipping you. It's called in the Quran the self-accusing spirit. When that's whipping you like that, just say, okay, okay, Allah. If you will forgive me and have mercy on me and strengthen me, I'll strive harder tomorrow to be better. You're not going to be all that you could be just because you want to be. You're going to be all that you could be as long as you keep striving to be. And most of us that call ourselves Muslims, I'm going to say a word that will hang everyone in the room. We've stopped striving. See? Now, surely... I, we say, have turned. But you can't turn on your own. Surely, I am being turned to him who originated the heavens and the earth. And I am not of the polytheists. I'm not going to worship money. I'm not going to worship my wife or that beautiful daughter or that beautiful son or my career or my talent. I'm going to worship only God. I am not of the polytheists. Surely my prayers, my sacrifice, my life, and my death are all for Allah, the Lord of the worlds. No associate has he. And this am I commanded, and I am of those who submit. Oh, I wish that we would say that and mean it tonight, that I am of those who submit. It's not easy. Oh, I love you too, my sister. Very, very, very much. Very, very much. Let me finish. I'm nervous, they say. I think I'll smoke a cigarette or better. I'll get me some weed. But you just said I submit. So if you submit, God is not telling you, go get some reefer if you're nervous. Go take a drink if you're nervous. He said, come to me. I am the one that will suffice, not some of your needs, all of your needs, but you got to come to me when you're weak and you need strength because I am the mighty and the wise. He said, come to me. And I am of those who submit. Oh Allah, thou art not a king, the king. There is no God but thee. Thou art my Lord. And I am thine servant. 
Oh, that's really beautiful. But look at this next one. I have been greatly unjust to myself. And I do confess my faults. Well, heck, if you're in unjust to yourself, who stands a chance? See, so in the mosque, the injustice that we sometimes do to ourselves, we do it to others. And that's why forgiveness and atonement is proper in order to get past the hurt and the pain that we caused ourselves and may have caused others. I've been unjust to myself and I confess my faults. Now, you know, they say confession is good for the soul. I'm not asking you to go get father so-and-so and confess because he probably need to confess too. But, <laughs> you see, God already knows our madness. He already know. You can't tell him nothing about yourself that he don't know. But when you get in your prayer and you tell him the thing that you've discovered about yourself that he already knows, just confessing it is getting it up off of you. And I confess my faults, not my neighbors. That Negro did so. No, 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 no. Your faults. So grant me protection against all my faults. For none grants protection against faults but thee. And turn away from me. No, guide me to the best of morals. For none can guide me to the best of morals but thee. And turn away from me the evil and indecent morals. For none can turn away from me the evil and indecent morals but thee. See? Now if we would pray this prayer... And tonight, go home and ask yourself, what does God require of me to help my people? And I'll tell you, he requires that we make a sacrifice of something that we're doing that may give us pleasure, but it's not right. Can you cast it aside to discover your purpose in life. Blessed is the man or the woman who discovers their purpose for being. Then you don't live an empty life. Every day you live has meaning because you're fulfilling your purpose. Come on, brothers and sisters. I'm appealing to you to rise up from where you are. Get up. No, jump up. And make a faster pace. And let's go after our people in Atlanta. In unity. Let us be in ranks like a solid wall. Now, tomorrow, if it's the will of Allah, we'll be walking for prostate cancer. And I hope that you'll be walking with your brother. We start forming at about 8.30, and the march kicks off at 9. It's not really a march. It's just a leisurely walk. I can't walk as fast as I used to, so, and I ain't trying. I just want to make the walk. 
but tomorrow tonight is the end of our fast of Ramadan and all those who made it give yourself a hand and all those who made some of it give yourself a hand All those who read the Holy Quran all the way through, give yourself a hand. All those who read some of the way through, give yourself a hand. <laughs> now, I'm going to spend this next few days in the city, but I wanted to come to you tonight. And I personally, you know, want to thank uh, Brother Sharif and, and the brothers and sisters. I think, I think Brother has great potential. But right now, Help is needed to take away the burden of debt. The mosque has a nut to crack every month, and it's kind of heavy. I'd like to look into it. The key is not draining the people that you have. The key is getting others to join you and share the burden that cannot be borne just by a few. But if you feel oppressed, it will be difficult for you to invite people to join you. But if you are happy and filled with the spirit of love for one another, it would be easy to fill the mosque over and over and over again. And the more people you have, the more people you have to share the burden. I would like us to own this property. I hate the fact that we're renting. And the enemy knew that we had fixed it up, made it beautiful, so he keep increasing the rent. Uh, they know you're not going to leave what you fixed up like this. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask Allah to do something. But we might as well try to own the block. And I believe if that enemy would give us a price, we'll raise the money and own this building and the block and move out from here to other places. Well, that's our hope. Hope. But Allah may plague this fella Put something on him so he can go and ask Brother Sharif, is y'all ready to buy this place? It's a nice place to own. The block, that is. And I would like to see a center in Atlanta that's owned by the believers that you can afford to keep up. So we're going to put our heads together over the weekend, see what we can come up with. And may Allah bless you and strengthen you and give you his peace and the joy of being a Muslim. 
And whatever trial comes our way because of our faith, know that Allah is heavily involved. Give good news, he said, to those who are patient and steadfast under trial. Thank you for listening and may Allah bless you. As I greet you in peace, Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>